Twitter sama kita. We got part two. Alright, I shared the, I shared it across uh Clubhouse and you know also. Alright. So John seventeen is where I want to start. John seventeen. In fact, I might go ahead and do it from the new King James Version just to be sure. If you have not subscribed to the Garden Ministry, please. Alright. John 17 from the new King James Version. All right, I'm going to start at verse number one. Make sure it's picking up. Okay, we can see it clear. Verse one. Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven, and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son also may glorify you. As you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this, hold on, I'm going to stop right there first. I'm going to stop right there first. (laughs) I almost went into it already. All right, first thing to note, We have a lot of glorifying going on. But the point is verse number two. And if you don't have your garden glasses on, you will overlook this. Verse two states, as you have given him authority over all flesh that he should give eternal life as many as you have given him. So this individual who we call the Messiah, the Christ was given authority over all flesh but within that authority that he was given it was up to him to give eternal life to who he wanted. So even though he had dominion over all flesh, he chose to only work with a group within that flesh that he had authority over. So can we understand first off that even though authority is given to a group over everybody, It's up to them who they want to work with within that authority they are granted. That makes sense, my brother? I bet. So, what just happened there, though? It says that he has given him authority over all flesh. Where is that coming from? Well, as y'all know, Garden ministry, we in the garden again. Let's go to a passage where this was actually supposed to happen. Genesis chapter 1, verse number 26. And God said, uh, this is out of the JPS, the Jewish Publication Society, I believe that's what that stands for. It's supposed to be the oldest um, uh, text that we have from the Hebrew, which would be the Masoretic, uh, converted over or translated into English. So this is out of JPS. It says, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and every and sorry and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth and this is what paul was talking about not all flesh is the same flesh 
or he started naming the different types of flesh. Well, Christ had authority over all of those different types of flesh that Paul named. And we find out in Genesis 1, 26, that's what the man created after the image of the God was supposed to do. So Christ is proclaiming his Genesis 1, 26 Adamic body or, or authority. This Adam in Genesis 1, 26, Christ is claiming that this is about him and what he has going on. So, just a correlation first. Christ is proclaiming the Genesis 1.26 statement is about him. So whatever we make Genesis 1.26 be about, it's got to be about Christ. But this is what they leave out in Genesis 1.26. It's about a unity of people. It's about male and female. But we'll talk about that as time progresses. And you're going to see that as time progresses within our book. What that is about. But now, uh, I ain't lost nobody yet. Uh, 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 you got me, my brother? I bet. Bet, 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 bet. Britt, down there, you got me? Throw me an emoji up you still listening. That's what I want you to do. Appreciate you. <laughs> I'm crazy. This is... So now, let's keep going. Uh, back to John 17. Back to John 17. This is what John 17 says. As you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. So now we find out that this Genesis 1:26 Adam was going to be given out eternal life. Today we're talking about what is life. So now, once I go into the Strong's, and it's really not going to uh, explain per se. What life is is going to give a vague definition, but what I'm going to show is that this word for life that we finna go over is going to be the same word throughout. So they're not going to change the word in the Greek for life. So when I go to uh, John 17, verse number one, sorry, verse number two, the word life is. Uh, Zoe, Zoe is from G2198, life, literally or figuratively, life or lifetime. So this means life. So when you see G2222, understand it's talking about the same life, the same word. It's not going to flip flop. Now, it's going to show you why, I'm going to show you why I had to, uh, Go over there. I'm going to show you because uh, people might want to wordplay and say gardens don't know. What, we don't know what we're talking about in the garden. So this is what it says. It says, he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. Verse 3. And this is eternal life. So now, Brother Mike, can we say that maybe Christ is going to give his Definition of eternal life. If he say this is eternal life, so no matter where we go from what life means, we probably got to stick within the parameters of what the life giver says it means, right? Facts. So now we're going to see if he's talking about physical life. Because we proved, we proved last week it wasn't talking about physical death. So now, if the death is physical, and you disagree with us, let's see if this life is going to be physical so we can have a yin-yang thing going on, a balance. Let's see. Verse number three. 
it says, and this is eternal life, that, that they may know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. This is eternal life. What is eternal life, Christ? That they may know you. The eternal life that Christ was providing was knowledge of the Father. Mike? Mike? <laughs> Is if if eternal let's 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 not even think about it. let's just don't we can think about the Bible. Let's just use a little common sense. And me and Mike, we haven't rehearsed this at all. Did we rehearse anything, brother? Not at all. So I'm gonna ask my brother a question. If eternal life is knowledge of the Father, what would resurrection be? Oh my, see? You see? You see how? You see how? That's the book. The book is over with. The book is over. <laughs> what are we doing here? You feel me? What are, what are we doing here, people? Now, one time, did Christ bring up somebody? I not did one time Christ say that you're going to be breathing on earth forever. Not one time. And uh, Josephus, if you want to come up, bro, raise your hand. I'll bring you up, my brother. In fact, let me go ahead and send you that invite right there. Let me go ahead and send you that invite. Okay, bet, bet. There you go right there. Let me go ahead and, and mod you up. Oh, it says this user's not in the room. Mine, true. Okay, bet then. So, yeah, yeah, you in the room? I don't know why I said that, my brother, but it's, yeah, you were here, though. So, it clearly states that eternal life, I'm going to read it again, verse 3. Yeah, I'm going to read it out in the book. Verse 3, and this is eternal life, that I'm going to give you organs that never stop working. I'm going to give you a heart that never stop pumping. I'm going to take an old body away and give you the same new body. It's just going to do different stuff. None of that is said right there. This is what he says. This is eternal life that they may know you. So if your definition of eternal life is outside of knowledge of the Father... You have a different gospel. You in 2nd Matthew, 3rd Matthew, 4th Matthew, 3rd Colossians, you're making up stuff. So now, let's keep going. And this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So you got to know the Father, and you got to know Christ, whom he has sent. But we're going to find out what all that means later on. Verse 4, I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. Notice, Christ said all the things he did on earth was to glorify the Father and to finish the work the Father has given him to do. When did Christ ever say it was about him? He said, I am a participant in the grand scheme of things. And I'm going to show you why we said, why Christ said it's about him in, in a few. We're going to show you what's going on here. So, and I'm not taking Christ away because he is the example. 
He is the vital figure. Without Christ being in the story, we don't have a story. But people have started taking other characters out of the story to understand what Christ meant to do. So we can all agree that this was Christ bringing the Father to earth. And he was given that authority to do that. But Christ, it was up to Christ to use which people he had authority over. He, it was up to him to, ch to choose which element of people he wanted to give the knowledge of the Father to. That was on Christ. Well, let's go to verse number, let's see here, six through eight. Let's listen to what Christ says. I have manifested your name to the men whom you have given me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me. And they have kept your word. Does this not sound like an inheritance? They were yours. You gave them to me. Inheritance. Verse 7, now they have known that all things which you have given me are from you. Okay, so everything Christ got was from the Father. Verse number 8, for I have given to them the words which you have given me. What did Christ give them? Did he give them something tangible? Or did he give them something a little bit more spiritual? He says, I have given them the words which you have given me. So, according to Christ, if Christ says, that he was giving eternal life to whomever. And he said that he gave them the words. Is Christ not saying the words are eternal life? Mike Josephus? Is that what he's making right here? So we we so we're looking more at, at words here. I guess words are way more powerful than Christ raising somebody up from the dead. It seems maybe words were more powerful. Go ahead, bro. Go ahead, brother Mike. Oh, uh, you feel me? We 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 work with me. You feel me? This, this is where we're going. <laughs> it would appear, maybe, just maybe, we've been concentrating on the wrong thing. So let's, let's keep going. Let's keep going. Let's keep going. He says, for I have given to them the words which you have given me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came forth from you, and they have believed that you sent me. All right, so now, let's go to John chapter 5. So that was John 17, 1 through 4, 6 through 8. Right now we're talking about what is life. So John chapter 5, we're going to go down to verse 39. Let's listen to what Christ says. He says, you search the scriptures. For in them, you think you have eternal life. The word life right there, same G222, same word. For in them, you think you have eternal life and these are they which testify of me 
Now, it would appear that Christ told them the scriptures that you guys are studying, that's not where the true eternal life is going to be at. They're just a testimony of Christ. Now, this is going to get real powerful later on, but just keep remembering, Christ keeps saying these things are about him. So, if you are searching the scriptures, thinking that's how you're going to get eternal life, you are mistaken. And it's the reason why you're mistaken. Because they are just a testimony. They're just a testimony. It's more to come behind it. Verse 40. But you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. Now, they were going to synagogues. They were doing the law of Moses to a degree. You know, it was, it was a burden and they couldn't do them completely. But they were attempting their own way to do these things that Scripture said do. But Christ seems like he's making it more personal than the laws they receive. Because we can't admit the Scriptures are the laws, right? There's some laws in the Scripture. So he's saying, go ahead, go ahead, brother. So, so he's saying that those laws, you think there's life in those laws, in those stories. You think there's life in it, but they're a testimony of me. But you guys are not willing to come to me that you may have life. So once you skedaddle a little bit back to Matthew 23, this sounds something similar to what Christ said in verse 37. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stone those that are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. So Christ has been saying, I, not the scriptures, but I wanted to gather you together. But you guys was refusing to gather under me. You guys are refusing to gather up under the eternal life that I'm bringing. Remember, they said, uh, we are Moses' disciples. We know Moses spoke to God, but we don't know if this fellow has received anything from God. But Christ is saying that he was going to be the one to teach them about God. So it kind of makes you wonder, what did Moses teach them about? It's just something to ponder on. Matthew 11. All right, so now, let's see what Christ was trying to offer. Once again, I know this is about life, and all, and all this is going to tell us what life is, so we're just getting the backstory. Matthew 11, verse 28 and 29. You remember Christ said that he wanted to gather them as a chick gather her hens. Now, a few months ago, me and the brothers of RPK, AOSD, we came together and we looked at a chick. We pulled up some, some uh, me and the brothers and sisters of RPK, AOSD, and etc. Uh, we came together and looked at a video of some chicks and how chicks gather her chicklets under her wings. And we saw that really the, the chick 
chicken just opened her wings up and the chicklets runs under her wings. So the gathering of a chicken to her chicklets was her being the parent, the, the parental figure and the children running up under her for protection. So the mother stood there, arms open. That should remind you of a cross. Mother stood there, arms open, arms spread, wings are spread, wings open, wings spread apart. Shows you like a cross. Should remind you of Moses too when they were fighting and he had to have both his arms held up in order for Israel to win to uh, win the war. This is our imagery. A chick holding up her wings, the chicklets come up under her wings. Shape of a cross, sort of. Those chicklets came to the mother. So, listen to what Christ said. How often would I have gathered you together? That's them supposed to be coming to him, partaking of the gathering. But look what verse 28 says. Matthew eleven twenty-eight. 28. Come to me. Same gathering passage should remind you of the Feast of Tabernacles also when they had to gather when they had to gather together in the tabernacle. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Listen to what Christ is offering. I will give you rest. If anybody knows about anything, about the Bible, this ain't going to be a shocker, but I'm going to say. So let's skedaddle to Genesis 2, Genesis 2, verse 2, from the GPS. And on the seventh day, God finished his work which he had made, that's labor, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. So could this be talking about literal work here? What Christ said is my father always worked. He's been working from the beginning. So could this be talking about that type of work? Think about it. And remember, we was already on day six, Adam, in John 17. So now, in Matthew 11, Christ is saying, Come unto me, all ye who labor and are in heavy laden, and I will give you rest. This is Christ is talking about the point of Genesis chapter 2, verse 2 and 3. I'm going to read three. And God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it because that in it he rested from all his work which God in created had made. So this is a create, this is a day in which God is supposed to rest. Oh yeah. This is getting, this is going to get good. It says, verse number 28, Matthew 11, Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Now, Brother Mike, Brother Josephus, from reading what we just read, could we say that Christ's rest that he's offering is something they have to learn. So this is something mentally, right? I mean, <laughs> you feel me? This is something they got to learn. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, 
and you will find rest for your souls. So Christ just declared, what you learn from me will give rest to your souls. It, I mean, book is over with. That's the book. That's the book. We've been telling y'all, this is things dealing with the mind. These are mindsets. It's all about the mind, the mind, the mind, the mind. And here's Christ telling you, I'm going to teach you something. And what I teach you is going to give you rest. So, we got to get the carnality and put it down. But guess what? We're not done yet. We're not done. Verse 30. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. How easy is it once you're doing a law and you think that you got to do this law? You think you got to do these 600 and something odd, 33, 666, 640. How many ever people make up? How many it is? I don't know. I never counted. So all I'm saying is probably over 600 because it's a lot of words. That's going on in the Torah. So, how hard would it be for you to go from works to learning something? And what you learn is supposed to be equivalent to the 600 and something laws you have been doing for almost 1,500 years. Think about it. Easier to trade off. He says, my yoke is easy. What Moses brought definitely wasn't easy. Moses said it was easy. Oh, he said it. He said it was easy. Everything I told y'all, that's easy to do. But he didn't even get in the promised land. So it couldn't have been that easy. But anyway, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So, Let's go back so we can agree that if Christ is offering them rest for their souls, then maybe he's offering them life for the same souls that he's getting he's giving rest to. So not only is he giving them rest, he's giving them life too, because we read in John 17, he gave them life. So now when we go to let's go back to John. Let's go to John 6. We're talking about what is life. John 6, 60 through 63. Once again, what is life? John 6, 60 through 63. Let's see what life is. Remember, in John 17, he told them uh, this is eternal life when they learn of the Father. This is eternal life. So let's see in John 6 if what he says is true. John 6, 60. Therefore, many of his disciples, when they heard this said, this is a hard saying, who can understand it? This is after uh, Christ had told them how they got to eat his flesh, drink his blood. He's the manna from heaven. He didn't say all of this stuff, and they're like, what are you talking about? So now they say, this is a hard saying. Who can understand what he's talking about? So verse 61, when Jesus knew in himself that his disciples co complained about this, he said to them, does this offend you? What then, if you should see the Son of Man ascend where he was before? Hopefully everybody went to Acts chapter 1 in their mind. When they saw the Son of Man ascend to where he was before, how Acts 1 is actually what John is talking about here. But I want you to think about something deeper. <clears throat> Listen to what Christ did here. Put your, guard, put your garden glasses back on. It says, What then if you should see the Son of Man a sin where he was before. 
verse 63. It is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. You want to talk about the Holy Spirit. You want to talk about eternal life. Christ tries to give you the definition of it all. The words I speak to you are spirit. They are life. Now, think about what just happened here in 62 and 63. He says, what, should, what if you see the Son of Man ascending where he was before? Where was he before? In heaven. Where is heaven? Uh, sorry, uh, what could be considered heaven? Heavenly Jerusalem, the Garden of Eden. So he says, what if you should see the Son of Man ascend where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. So, think about it. An ascension into heaven is the spirit that gives life. Spirit gives life, then ascension into heaven. Ascension into heaven, and the spirit gives life. What in the world is Christ talking about? Let's go back to Genesis. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis 2, verse number 7. And the Lord, then the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. It is the Spirit that gives life. The Lord breathe into the nostrils the breath of life. So we have here the Spirit giving life. But what else did Christ say? Christ said something about an ascension. What if you see the Son of Man ascend where he was before? Verse number 8. Let's read the, uh, the rest of verse 7. The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed in his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. Verse 8. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. Man formed on earth. Man ascended into heaven. Man formed on earth. Man ascended into heaven. Well, let's first man formed on earth, man gets breath of life from spirit, man ascends into heaven. Let's say it one more, one more time. Man on earth, man gets breath of life, man ascends into heaven. So, how did Christ explain this? This is the explanation that Christ gave. Verse 61 and John 6. Now, sorry, verse 63. It is the Spirit who gives life. Okay, we understand that, Christ. That's what happened in John 2. The flesh profits nothing. We understand that, Christ, because uh, when he was in fleshly form, he was dead. When he was made from dust, he was dead. The words that I speak to you are spirit. He breathed into the man. I speak to the man. Man ingested the spirit. Man ingested the word. Think about what's going on. The words that I speak to you are spirit. They are life. What I tell you brings you to life. What I tell you gives you 
the Spirit. Let me say it again. What I tell you, this is what Christ is saying. The words that I tell you are giving you spirit and life. They are what make you ascend into heaven. Learn from me and I'm going to teach you something that will make you ascend to heaven. It's all about the words. In John, I mean, sorry, in Genesis, it said the, the spirit breathed into the flesh or into the, the man of the dust. That's equivalent to a fleshly man receiving words of Christ. The words are the spirit. The words give life. So Genesis 2 is equivalent to, Gen to John 6.63. And what, uh, what I'm saying, is that making sense, or do I need to say it another way? Oh, bet, bet, hey, I bet, hey, hey, and I, I'm almost, I'm almost done. Uh, oh, okay, bet, 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 hey, well, well, put a marker where you at so you don't forget then. I bet. <laughs> so now, let me show you, an, uh, let me show you another example. Let's, let's look at another example of this. Just to show you that what I'm saying, I'm not tripping. Here's another example. Once you go to Ezekiel, let's go to Ezekiel, what's it, 36? Ezekiel 36. Let's see if it's the valley of the problem. 37. Appreciate that, my brother. Ezekiel 37. Let's look at the dry bones. Now, notice what I said. It's the words. Christ, well, it was Christ who said, it's the word that gives spirit. It's the words that give life. And I said, that's equivalent. Christ speaking to people is equivalent to Genesis 1, the spirit being blown in their body and they're living and then they're going into heaven. Let's see if Ezekiel 37 has the same type of scenario. Is from this is from the Britain Septuagint, Ezekiel thirty-seven. Let's go to verse six or well, verse five. Thus says the Lord to these bones: Behold, I will bring upon you the breath of life, and I will lay sinews upon you, and will bring you, and will bring up flesh upon you, and will spread skin upon you, and will put my spirit into you, and ye shall live, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. Sounds real good, right? Listen to verse 7. So I prophesied as the Lord commanded me. This is Ezekiel using words I, that the Lord gave him. I prophesied as the Lord commanded me. And it came to pass while I was prophesying, while I was speaking words from the Lord, that behold, there was a shaking, and the bones approached each one to his joint. And I looked, and behold, sinews and flesh grew upon them, and skin came upon them above, but there was no breath in them. Guess what? The breath has not came yet. They got the flesh. They are in flesh. Remember Christ said the flesh prophesied, prophesied nothing. They are in flesh, even though they receive this prophecy, they are in flesh, it prophesied, it prophesied, I mean, it profited nothing. But let's see what continues to happen. Verse 9, and he said to me, prophesy into the wind. So now he has to give more words from the Lord. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, why the, why, why the Lord didn't do it? Why did Ezekiel have to be the one to do it? Why did Ezekiel have to use the word of the Lord in order for these things to happen? Thus says the Lord, come from the four winds and breathe upon these dead men and let them live. So I prophesied more words coming from Ezekiel from the Lord. So I prophesied as he commanded me and the breath entered into them and they... Live and stood 
upon their feet a very great congregation. Ezekiel, give them the words I give you so they can live. Christ said, my words are spirit and life. Verse 11, and the Lord spake to me, saying, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel, and they say, Our bones are become dry. Our hope has perished. We are quite spent. We are tired. We are laboring. Our hope is gone. That's equivalent to them being dead. He says in verse 12, and 13, and then I'm going to go to John 3, uh, I'm going to read a few more, and then Brother Mike, you got it if you don't mind. You there? Alright, so bet. So here we go. This is verse 12 and 13. Therefore prophesy and say, thus said the Lord, listen to the words that's going to make them resurrect. Listen to the words. Thus said the Lord, Behold, I will open your tombs and br will bring you up out of your tombs and will bring you into the land of Israel. Now, before I read verse 13, notice what Christ said in John 17. I'm going to give them eternal life. This is eternal life that they know you. Verse 13 of Ezekiel 37. And ye shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened up your graves. So we clearly see the life that Ezekiel was trying to give the northern kingdom was going to be something that gave them knowledge of the Lord. And the knowledge of the Lord came through prophesying, which are words. My words are spirit and life. He says, and I will put my spirit in you. Sorry, and you should know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, that I may bring up my people from their graves and will put my spirit within you, and ye shall live, and I will place you upon your own land. Same terminology, what happened to Adam. Adam was in the flesh. He received the word of the Lord, a.k.a. the spirit, and he was placed into his own land, the heavenly abode, Jerusalem. Heavenly Jerusalem. All right, so now, let, let me let me hurry up and finish, uh, and then uh, I'm, I'm gonna turn it over to my brother Mike because I know he wanna he wanna uh, finish cooking on some of this food that, that I'm trying to uh, prepare for. Him. So now let's go to John three. Who who would have thought that, that Christ was using the Garden of Eden like he's using and trying to explain more what's going on with Adam? So once you go to John 3, verse 2 through 8. Now, now this is another one. This is another one. I know I didn't went over this a couple of times, but I'm going to go over it again. So this is going to be John 3, 2 through 8. Let's once again show what Christ is talking about. John 3, 2. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. For no one can do these things that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. What are you talking about, Christ? Nicodemus pretty much said the same thing. What are you talking about? Verse 4. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? 
Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered. Listen to what Jesus says. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. I'm going to read verse 6 before I, I, I get a break now. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. So you got flesh, you got spirit. We know flesh profited nothing. Christ was saying that I'm going to give them eternal life. And eternal life is knowledge of the Father. So now, how do we separate that from being born again, being resurrected again, having a new life? Because that's what being born again means. Newness of life. Let me say it again. That's what being born again means. Newness of life. If you are born again, that means that you're supposed to have a new life because you receive life again. Born again. So if you're born the first time, what did you do? I started off as a baby. I lived life into an adult. So now, what is born again? It's the same principle. Starting off as a baby entering uh, all the way up into adulthood. And Paul clearly states this also. Uh, when I was a child, I thought I was a child, now I'm a grown man, and etc. Uh, there's plenty more illusions. But let's show you where Christ got this information from. Why is Christ talking about you got to be born of water and spirit in order to enter into the kingdom of heaven? Because they tell you, oh no, brother, this is about the washing of the water of the word or whatever that means. But uh, for every, uh, who knows what that's supposed to mean. But let's show you what Christ is talking about. Oh, so this is, let's go back into Genesis once again. So we didn't already explain what's happening in Genesis chapter 2. Someone must receive the word and then they get the spirit and enter into the kingdom of heaven. But. Let's see what else has to occur. Genesis chapter 2. We're going to read verse number 5. In fact, we can go to verse number 6. But I, I, I will find this is, In every herb of the field before it was on the earth, and all the grass of the field before it sprang up. So this is day three. For God had not rain on the earth, and there was not a man to cultivate it. You see the word rain right there. That's water, right? This is verse six. But but there rose a fountain out of the earth. If anyone knows, fountain means Water. Fountain means water. Remember, Christ said you have to be born of the water and spirit to see the kingdom of God. Let's see where he got that from. Verse 6. But there rose a fountain out of the earth and watered the whole face of the earth. So everything is covered by water. Verse 7, and God formed the man of the dust of the earth. Guess what? That dust is covered by water. The whole face of the earth was covered by water. Therefore, the dirt that was on, I'm sorry, the dust that was on the face of the earth was covered by water. Christ said, you got to be born of water 
and spirit in order to see heaven. So now the water is covering the earth. And it says, and God formed the man of the dust of the earth. So man had water on top of him because man came from the dust that had the water on it. So man was formed of the dust. But guess what was on top of the dust? The water. So you have water. And then what else Christ said? You got to be born of water. And then you got to be born of the spirit. God planted, sorry. There rose a fountain out of the earth and watered the whole face of the earth. That's your water. And God formed man of the dust of the earth. And breathed into his face the breath of life. That's the spirit. Water. Spirit. Water. Baptism. Spirit comes next. And the man became a living soul. You got to be born of water and spirit in order to see the kingdom of heaven. What happened next? Man became a living soul. God planted a garden uh, eastward in Edom and placed there the man whom he had formed. Now man can enter into the kingdom of God. Let me say it again. First water. In the spirit, and then Adam was finally able to go into the Garden of Eden. Christ said he had to be born of water, spirit, to see the kingdom of God. Adam himself was born of water and spirit to see the kingdom of God. So Nicodemus says, and if you think about it, that clearly would rep represents a woman's body because a baby is inside of her, uh, what is it called? The uh, placenta, what is all that called? The placenta that has water inside of it. So it's clearly built like a woman's body. Just in case you didn't catch the analogy. It's clearly built like a woman's body. Water and flesh. Or uh, 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 sorry, uh, water and spirit. Because then the spirit into the tools of the baby. Anyway, it, it, it makes perfect sense the analogy he's using. But this is why I set up like this. So Nicodemus is asking about a grown man because the way Genesis is talking, if you take it as a literal at literal value, it's not talking about a grown man being born again. It's talking about a grown man being born the first time. Now we know personally the deeper meaning is the grown man being born again in Genesis chapter two. But just for the flat reading, it's talking about a grown man being born the first time. So, if you want to see the scenario where this is played out again from a grown man, let's go to Matthew chapter 5. I mean, is it 4? Matthew 4. I think it's 4. Matthew 4. And let's see if we can see it being played out again. No, Matthew 3. Sorry. Matthew 3. Matthew 3. Let's see what happens. Remember he said you got to be born of water and then of the spirit. Then you see the kingdom of heaven. Let's see what happened. Matthew chapter 3. Let's see here. Verse number 15 and 16. Remember, born of spirit. I mean, saw water, spirit, enter into the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 3, 15. Jesus answered and said unto him, Suffer it to be a soul now. For thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. And Jesus, when he was baptized, that's water, went up straightway out of the water, just in case we didn't know this water, and lo, the heavens were open to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lightning unto him. So the Spirit came unto him, that's the water, baptism. That's the spirit, and then what it says, a person cannot see the kingdom of God unless he's born of water and spirit. Verse 17, and a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. It seems like the Lord got begotten right there. And then what happened in verse number four? 
He's led up to be tempted of the devil through three temptations, just like Adam and Eve did when they went into the Garden of Eden. And guess what happened after Satan had to flee from him? Verse 11, then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. In Genesis 1, that did not happen. The angels blocked the tree of life because they felt the temptations. Here, the angels ministered unto the Lord because he passed the temptations. The point is, the whole being born of water, spirit, that's dealing with baptism, and etc. But what was John the Baptist doing? in order for the baptism to occur. Verse number 1 and 2, I'm almost done, y'all. 1 and 2, in those days came John the Baptist, sorry, Matthew 3, 1 and 2. In those days came John the Baptist preaching, that's words, everybody, in the wilderness of Judea, saying, repent ye, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Verse 6, and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. Verse 11, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. So John was teaching the people repentance words. Because what was John supposed to do? According to Malachi, make a path for I don't want to, I don't even want to butcher Malachi 4 and verse number, is it 4 or is it 3? Hold on. Behold, I send it to you. No, oh, it's not. Malachi 3 and 1. Behold, I send my messenger and he shall prepare the way before me. He's preparing the way for the Lord. And what is he, what, in, pre, in preparation, what is he doing? Telling the people to repent. So he's teaching using words to tell the people to repent from their evil doings so they could know the Lord. Once again, words. His words got the people to repent. His words I, I, I had Christ come to him. And when Christ listened to his words and was baptized, he went through the being born of the water and then being born of the spirit. All dealing with words. All right, y'all. So now, let's, I'm, I'm going to shoot through these last and then I'll be done. Uh, Romans. Romans 8. Just in case. We don't understand what's going here on here. Romans 8, 4 through 10. Uh, it says that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. That's uh that's actually another uh, Garden of Eden reference. But let's let's keep going. Verse 5. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. Verse 6, just in case we don't understand what's going on in the Garden of Eden. For to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life. That's the same word, G222. And peace. For to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Do not eat from this tree of knowledge of good and evil. I am not in subject to that command because I am carnally minded. Therefore, they could not stay into the kingdom of heaven. They had to leave out. They had no knowledge of the Lord anymore. They died. It was carnally minded. It was foolishness to them. So then, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. 
but ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so, be that the spirit of God dwell in you. If God dwells in you, and what was the spirit? My words are spirit. Learn of me. If the words of God dwell in you, now if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his, and if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. The spirit is life. The body is dead. Genesis 2. The body was dead until it received the spirit, and then it was allowed to see the kingdom of heaven. So now, uh, this will be the last one, Brother Mike. Deuteronomy 30, 18 through 20. These are my last two verses. Knowledge of the Lord is life. So you have to study Christ's words to understand what life is. So this is Deuteronomy 30, 18 through 20. This is what it states from the JPS. But if thou heart turn away and will not hear, but shall be drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I declare unto you this day that ye shall surely perish, that's die, Cornerly minded death. Ye shall not prolong your days into the land. Exactly what happened to Adam and Eve. Whether thou passest over Jordan to go in to possess it. I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day. That I have set before thee life and death. The blessing and the curse. So blessing is equivalent to life. Therefore, choose life that thou mayest live. Thou and thy seed. Choose life. Alright, so now. Let even Moses explain what life is in Torah. This is what Moses says. To love the Lord thy God. To hearken to his voice. That will be Christ the word. And to cleave unto him. Christ. What a, what a wife supposed to do to her husband, cleave unto him. This is why Christ had to marry the church. But anyway, let's read it again. To love the Lord thy God, to hearken to his voice, and to cleave unto him. For that is thy life. Not breathing oxygen, not, not the breath of oxygen, not getting a heart, uh, a literal heart transplant by doctors. Uh, not receiving a blood transplant by doctors, not eating right, not lifting weights, uh, not all of this other stuff. That's not the eternal life the Bible is talking about. Never was the Bible talking about you breathing on earth forever. Christ clearly told us what eternal life was in John 17, 1 through 4, 6 through 8, what we went over. He told us his words and spirit and life. We read it in John 6, 60 through 30. Now we got Moses explaining to us once again what life is. This is life. To love the Lord thy God. To hearken to his voice and cleave unto him. For that is thy life in the length of thy days. That is eternal life. Length of days, eternal. That is thy life in length of days. That is eternal life. That thou mayest dwell in the land which the Lord swore to thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give them land of Canaan was just a proxy for the Garden of Eden. That was thy life. So when Christ told them that the law and the commandments, sorry, the, uh, the commandments and the law are the law and the prophets hung upon two commandments, love the Lord, love the neighbor as yourself, they ask, what must, the, the, the do ask, what must we do to get eternal life? Christ went here in Torah because Torah explains eternal life is loving the Lord, hearkening to his voice, and cleaving into the voice. That is eternal life. And the voice is telling you, love your neighbors as yourself. This is what Christ came to teach. Love your neighbors like I love you. So, if Christ is telling us eternal life is love for the Lord, cleaving unto the Lord, and cleaving unto the word, that's what life means. You can't make it be physical. So just like we showed last week, death wasn't physical but spiritual. 
Life in the Bible is talking about spiritual, not physical. Resurrection is talking about spiritual, not physical. Thank you guys for listening in. Elvin Israel from the Garden Ministries, one of the Garden at Men. Welcome home. I'm done, Brother Mike.
credit here because he kind of hit this a while ago and we should start paying a lot more attention if what Jesus is saying is true we should start paying a lot more attention to what's written in the Psalms what's written in the Proverbs because a lot of a lot of that language that's being used there, I remember Josephus came to us and told us, I, I think Jesus is teaching out of Psalms, he's teaching out of Proverbs, because a lot of the things that we find there is a lot of the, uh, Jesus is quoting a lot of them. And I want to go to one that's spe more specifically. Uh, all right, it's going to be Proverbs 14. I'm going to go to Proverbs 14 because it sounds a lot like what Jesus is talking about in the Beatitudes. Uh, okay, John 14, I'll start at, I'm going to start at verse 26. In the fear of the Lord, there is no confidence, and his children will have a place of refuge. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life to turn one away from the snares of death. In a multitude of people is a king's honor, but in lack of people is the downfall of, of a prince. So that, that would be um, concerning unity and things like that. He who is slow to wrath has great understanding, but he who is impulsive exalts folly, a sound heart is life to the body, but envy is rottenness to the bones. He who oppresses the poor reproaches his maker, but he who honors him has mercy on the needy. The wicked is banished in his wickedness, but the righteous has refuge in his death. Wisdom rests in the heart of him who has understanding, but what is in the heart of fools is made known. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is reproach to any people. So you have, a, it, it, it's a lot of things, a lot of elements may not be exactly worded the same, but a lot of elements of what Jesus is teaching, he's pulling a lot of it out of Proverbs and Psalms and things of that nature. So we should start taking a lot of those things seriously um, and so that a lot more. I think those are the things that we should be meditating on. These are things that are dealing with, once again, with the mind, the soul, and our perception on life. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, Brother Mike, you mind if I add a little bit more to the statement, too? All right. I, I want to add just a little bit to your general point. Uh, and everything you brought out is, is, is very relevant. So, in fact, uh, when we was dialoguing with uh, Mr. Bell and everybody uh, was last week or the week before, uh, we were talking about atonement. He stated that, uh, well, the Bible states that, you know, love covers a multitude of sin. And uh, I brought that verse out. Uh, he let it be known that that's actually so uh, I agree with, uh, with you, Brother Josephus. Definitely agree that uh, Christ is using these wise and this wisdom literature in order to explain what's going on, what's going on, what mankind needs to know, which is something dealing with the internet, and something dealing with the internet, the knowledge of the Lord, which which the Lord's knowledge is real spiritual knowledge. And for this John 4 that you brought up, uh, I want to hear 13 and 14, and I want to hear just a little of the dialogue that you said that I uh, that came to my mind when you were speaking. Uh, John 4, 13 and 14, it says, Jesus answered and said unto her, let me make sure I make it right. Uh, yeah. Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. Well, whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. So this water that Christ was offering was going to be something inwardly, right? And this woman is saying, you know, give me this water that you see, that, that you're talking about. And he says, tell your husband to come hither and, and etc. But this is what I want to get to. First, the Lord... Uh, well, first he tells her that, verse 10, if thou knowest the gift of God 
and who it is to say to thee, give me to drink, that would have asked of him, and when he would have given thee living water. So he's offering to give her living water, and he says that living water that he was going to give her was going to spring up into everlasting life. Right? So so check check how this conversation goes. So the woman asks him, you know, on what mountain are we going to worship this stuff? I want to go to verse number 23, 24. So listen to how the conversation goes. So Christ offers her to give her living water. And then he offers to tell her that the water that he's going to provide is going to be a water that's going to be inwardly. And it's going to spring up into everlasting life. So, the woman asked him about the worship. So, this is verse 23. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Now, we know that his words are spirit, right? He said, my words are spirit, my words are life. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now notice, Brother Mike, Brother Josephus, as well as everybody in the audience, he says God is a spirit, and they that worship the Father must worship him in spirit and in truth. Listen to what the woman responded to that. The woman said unto him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ, when he is come, he will tell us all things. So Christ says, if a person worship the Father, will worship him in spirit and truth. Why would the woman respond, the Messiah is going to tell us all things? She made the worshiping the Father in spirit and truth be something that has to be told. You feel what I'm saying? But but I, but but I'm not I'm not I'm not done because there's something else to come from there too. So notice what she says. The woman said unto him, "I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he come." He will tell us all things. People, we should understand she's invoking a prophecy in Torah. What prophecy is she invoking in Torah? You go to Deuteronomy 18 and 18. Listen to the prophecy that she's invoking. Deuteronomy 18 and 18. I will start at 17. The Lord said unto me, They have said well, that which I have spoken. I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren, like unto thee, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I should command him. And hold on, let me see if I can read something. Okay, yeah, that's it right there. So now listen to what it says. I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren like unto thee. Now she said, I know, so in other words, they took this as a messianic prophecy. So we got to say that first. It couldn't be Joshua because Joshua definitely wasn't a messiah. But they took this as a messianic prophecy. And it says, I will raise, right, right, right. So, but, but no, listen, listen to what he said. Listen how beautiful this is. I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren, like unto thee. She said, Messiah is going to come, and he is going to tell us all things. And I will put my words in his mouth. What are they waiting on? The words of the Lord. They're waiting on the words of the Lord. It says, and he shall speak, speak 
unto them all that I shall command him. Everything I tell him, he shall speak unto them. So there, ain't, ain't, ain't 18, do you remember 18, 18 said they are actually waiting on words? So now, give me one second. Um, what, where, hello? Okay, John 12, 49. John 12, 49. Listen to John 12, 49 real fast. John 12, 49. I can say John 12, let's start at, let's, let's start at 44. Let's let, let, listen to how this beautiful, you know how people want the spirit this and want the life that and what is the Holy Spirit and what is life and what is death and they make it. Listen to, the Bible clearly explains itself if you let it talk to you. If you listen to the words, you will be able to, to see the kingdom of heaven. It comes not with observation. Verse 44. Jesus cried and said. He that believeth on me. Believeth. Hold on. He that believeth on me. Believeth not on me. But on him that sent me. And we read. I uh, mean we found out yesterday. From uh, Dr. PhD Dr. Klotz. In Aramaic. It doesn't say believeth on me. The true rendering is. Believeth with me. Uh, believe it like me, like me. It's a, 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 a false, a false translation of the, uh, of the was it, what was it, preposition right there. So it's really supposed to render in Aramaic, who, who that believeth like me, is still on me, but let's keep going. Verse 45, and he that seeth me, seeth him that sent me. I am come a light unto the world, that whosoever believeth on me shall not abide in darkness. And if any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not. For I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. He that rejected me and received not my words hath one that judge him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. What's judging them? The words. I'm going to read it again for the people. Verse 48. He that rejected me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. Verse 49. For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me. He gave me a commandment, what I should say, and what I should speak. Did Christ just not say right there, the Lord gave him the commandment and he spoke what the Lord told him to speak. So Christ declared he was the prophet of Deuteronomy 18.18. And he stated, I am not speaking on my own, I am speaking what the Lord commanded me to speak. And those same words are going to judge you. So Christ declared that his words are the judge. His words are the life. His words are the spirit. His words are the water. What more do we not what more do we need to understand this is about something that's supposed to change you inwardly and still try to find something carnal to come and take you away? You want to raise up your body from the ground, what the heck that's going to do? It literally did nothing because the story tells you it didn't do nothing. Christ raised up from the dead his literal body, if we want to say his body. His body raised up from the dead, and we still got how many people not believing in that story? In that same Bible, dealing with the, the, the rich man and Lazarus, the rich man was told it wouldn't matter if
if a person raised up from the dead or not. Literal. The people got the law and the prophets. They got the words. And if the words don't persuade them, neither will a person, if he raised from the dead, will persuade him. And then Christ literally did that, and he didn't persuade the people. Look at 2023 and tell me how many people he persuaded from raising from the dead his physical body. So, the words are true. The words bring life. The words are the point. And may I add, we are the Christ. I just, that, that'll be something for a different. That, that'll be something different. But go ahead, Brother Mike. <laughs> Back. You're going to try. Go all the way. Otherwise, don't even start. If you are going to try, go all the way. This could mean losing girlfriends, wives, relatives, jobs, and maybe your mind. Take it slow. Are you so?